Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror in detail, the realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First Story Wendigo Native Americans in the northern wilds believed that a vengeful spirit inhabited the untamed wilderness, preying on man and beast alike. A spirit born of desperation and unspeakable sin that warped the bodies and minds of those who would succumb and drive them to feast on their kin and whatever living things they could find. They called it a wendigo. I couldn't have been older than ten when my father took us hunting. My father, my older brother Bradley, and me, hiking through the Yukon like actual pioneers or fur traders. Bradley taught me a lot about tracking as we hiked, pointing out tracks in the mud and snow, broken branches, disturbances in the brush. Dad taught him, and he was teaching me. Dad always said it was because of the native blood in his veins that he preferred hunting off the trails and reserves. Looking back, I think it might be because he just didn't feel like paying for permits. We'd made it to the lodge we were staying in just before dusk. Any later would have probably been a death sentence for us, but I was too young to realize at the time. As we sat around the fireplace eating our MREs dad always kept in stock, I couldn't get something from the trip out of my head that I'd seen on our way up the mountain. It almost looked like a man, but something was just off. It was misshapen, twisted, unnaturally skinny, and had to be at least eight feet tall. It let out some kind of shrill, inhuman shriek before I watched its macabre, nude form bound off into the trees. Of course, I was the only one that saw it. Bradley and Dad both heard the call, but our dad said it was just an elk. I know what elk sound like, and that definitely wasn't it. This was something predatory, something guttural. My life wasn't the same after that trip. When we got home, I was absolutely consumed with what I'd seen. I even took to calling them, Wendy's, affectionately. Every piece of media related to the legend, every historical documentation, every book, movie, there's very little I didn't study extensively. When I got a little older, I even joined a message board for cryptid sightings but results were a lot less than I hoped to find. Crackpots and lunatics raving about Bigfoot and Chupacabra and Bog Beasts. Anyone who claimed to see a Wendigo was completely off their gourd, or their notes didn't line up. I knew I wasn't crazy, I knew what I saw. Eventually, I even moved to the Yukon after I graduated, taking up residence in a cabin and working as a dispatcher for a bobcat rental service. I knew that I could be the one to find a real Wendigo and reveal it to the world. That was 30 years ago. The bobcats are gone, but I'm still here. Just me, on the mountain range, in my cabin. At least I can say I became quite the hunter, or else I'd have died years ago. Elk and rabbit have sort of a gamey taste, but when it's all that's around, you get used to it fast. I occasionally run into people at a trading stand located a couple of hours east, but that's usually the extent of my interactions with other people face to face if hunters don't frequent the lodges that year. I couldn't tell you if Bradley's alive or dead. I'm pretty sure my dad must have died by now. Maybe that's why things went the way they did, but it had to happen. I had to be right. Had to be. What comes next? I need you to not judge me for. To someone removed from the situation, what follows is going to sound cruel, if not particularly gruesome. I'll admit it's never something I would have imagined myself doing when I was younger. Then again, I didn't think I'd do a lot of things. Always wanted to be a zoologist. I guess I still kind of am. Instead of a wife and a house, I had a cabin over an old storm cellar and a monster I hadn't seen for nearly 40 years. One could say that time sort of ravaged me or drove me insane, and maybe it did. Maybe it did, but it doesn't change what happened last spring. There was an early thaw last winter that gave way to a freak blizzard in. What the hell was it? I want to say early May. I have trouble keeping track of the months sometimes. It's all seasons to me. Anyway, this wasn't the usual snowstorm. 
I've seen plenty on the range, but this was something else. This was something almost biblical. High winds, whiteout conditions, dangerously low temperatures. I was fine on supplies for months and set to wait it out in the relative comfort of the cabin until I heard the damnedest thing, a chirp on my outside motion sensors. How these people found me, I have no idea. Half frozen to death, damn near breaking my door down. A man, a woman, two teenagers, all huddled in the snow. They didn't look well equipped at all for the white hell that was raining down on them, so I didn't really hesitate to bring them inside. My French isn't great, but I was able to gather that they were a family from Quebec that was doing some sightseeing and got caught off guard by the storm. They lost their way trying to navigate back to their camper and damn near died before they saw the lights through my windows. They were mostly grateful to get in somewhere warm and lucky enough to find someone willing to share some food. Father Renard, Mother Janine, 13-year-old Benoit, and 15-year-old Gwen. They were all nice enough happy to be alive. It got pretty clear that they were going to have to stay for a spell until the storm died down and they'd be able to navigate back. But Renard was able to show me on a map where they were trying to get to. Turns out they were a ways off. After the storm broke, I'd be able to lead them the several kilometers down to their campsite, but they'd have to at least stay the night. There wasn't much room in the main cabin, but I had a few army cots sitting around and there was plenty of room in the cellar, so I had Renard and Benoit help me move a few things up into the storage closet and set them up down there. As I closed the hatch to give my guests some privacy, I got to thinking. In Wendigo Legends, there's always something that causes the creature to come into being. Sometimes it's a curse, or they're born, or it's like a possession thing, but the most common source I've seen has always been one particularly gruesome thing. The act of cannibalism. Man-eating man, the most horrific abomination man could think of. Here I was, in a remote cabin, for weary travelers far from home, in a basement with one way in and one way out. Warning you now, this is where things start getting unpleasant, and the situation doesn't improve. Suffering wasn't something I wanted to cause, but it was going to have to happen. They were going to have to be desperate. Desperate enough for the unthinkable. Just before dawn, I threw a bucket down the steps, reclosed the hatch, and locked it down with an old tire chain and a padlock. I could hear them through the floor, confused and startled. Janine made her way up the steps and discovered the hatch wouldn't move. From what I was able to hear, there was the sound of confusion giving way to anxiety. Renard came to the top and gave the hatch quite a shove, only to discover the chain. They did their best to yell and speak to me, and I just kept acting like I couldn't understand them. After all, I don't really speak much French. They must have thought I was crazy at first. I need to make it known that I don't take pleasure in what had to happen, but there's not undoing what happened. I tried to make the situation as pleasant as possible, given the circumstances. The bucket was for whatever bathroom needs they had, and I was still feeding them, just not very much. They were on a liquid diet, all water and smoothies I'd make. From what I understood, it took around three weeks with no actual food for starvation to kill a person. Really, I was hoping it wouldn't take that long for one of them to give in and partake, but we had all the time in the world. Eventually, a search party would go looking for them, but we were far enough away from where they would look for them that we wouldn't be disturbed. I thought that the worst part was going to be the screaming, but that mostly stopped by the third day. No, the worst part one felt was the waiting. It was supposed to take three weeks, but I honestly lost track of the days and couldn't tell you how long they were down there. I don't know if I'd forgotten a stash of food down there, or if they were rationing, but they were holding on. Waiting on anything for weeks on end is torture, but waiting for people to die and eat each other? That's a whole other animal. One morning, I accidentally found a way to expedite the process a bit. I popped the hatch up a bit to roll their fluids down, and Benoit's arm grabbed my pant leg and damn near gave me a heart attack. I'm not exactly sure what he was planning, but he was holding on as tight as his malnourished arm could hold. With my other foot, 
I stomped down on the hatch a good two or three times, breaking the boy's arm. He finally pulled it back in, and I could hear him screaming in agony after falling back down the stairs. The sound of his arm breaking under my foot was absolutely stomach-turning, and I had to turn up some music just to drown out his screams. His parents pled with me for medical attention, but there wasn't anything I could do. If they got out, the experiment would be ruined. It wasn't long at all before Benoit's injury became infected. He was a tough kid and held on for as long as he could, but nature took its course. When I heard Janine wailing one night, I knew he was gone. I figured he would be the main course, so to speak, and resolved to cut off their rations until they finally ate him, but then the smell kicked in a couple of days after he passed. It was absolutely putrid coming through the floorboards, and I had to dispose of him. I just couldn't handle the smell. I made my way down the steps with my hunting rifle and ordered the family to the wall. They were definitely thinning, but they were holding on. When I realized I wasn't going to be able to drag the boy's body up the stairs by myself, I had to enlist Renard's help. One thing I'll say is that I absolutely respect Renard. That could not have been an easy thing to do, but he did it for his family. We managed to get the body up the stairs and out the door when he decided to try something stupid. Renard threw a punch that caught me across the jaw, but the force sent him stumbling over. I assume it was the last of his energy going into that punch. When he struggled to his feet to swing at me again, I smashed him in the head with the butt of my rifle. It must have been too hard of a strike, because he immediately went down and started convulsing, with his feet twitching and feebly kicking around in the snow. I'd fucked this man up beyond what I could repair at this point, and did the only merciful thing, shooting him in the head. As I stood in front of my cabin, surrounded by melting snow and two dead captives, another idea crossed my mind. When my dad took my brother and me hunting, he insisted that we did our part in every step of our kill, from tracking and stalking, to the actual killing, all the way to field dressing and processing. I discovered really quickly that processing a human being isn't that much different from a deer or any other big game. Less fur, different proportions, but the process and a lot of the cuts are the same. I was hesitant about taking anything from Benoit, since his infection had obviously killed him, and I didn't know how it would affect the meat. Couldn't exactly risk the girls getting sick and dying. Fortunately, Renard still had some usable meat in him despite being emaciated. I was able to get a few decent slices out of him, and then I got to work in the kitchen. Another day and a half passed before I peered down the hatch and laid out two bowls of stew. One was clearly starving and nearly ate it before Janine smacked it from her hand, knowing immediately something was wrong. She demanded to know where her husband was, but of course, that was between me and him. After that, there was no more water or smoothies, just day after day of stew set on the top step. For days passed before hunger finally took over and Janine stopped resisting Gwen's desire to put anything in her stomach. I don't know if Gwen just didn't know she was eating her father, or if she just didn't care at that point. Initially, I was disappointed to see that all Gwen had seemed to develop was a stomach bug, vomiting violently into their ship bucket. I was starting to lose hope. Had I wasted my life chasing a ghost story? Had I abducted and terrorized a family for nothing? These thoughts tortured me the entire day, until I started hearing what sounded like Gwen having a seizure in the cellar. The thumping and flopping gave way to some strange animalistic growling, with Janine weakly trying to comfort her daughter. The next morning, it happened. I finally heard it. The sound I'd waited my whole life to hear again the shriek of a wendigo. I opened the hatch and investigated to see Gwen, or what used to be Gwen, nude, hunched over her mother's corpse, tearing pieces of the abdomen out and mindlessly eating them. Her body was warped, nearly skeletal, as she used her newly developed claws to tear chunks of flesh from Janine. Her head snapped in my direction with an unnatural quickness, shedding clumps of hair with each twitch. Her face had completely warped, 
with blood and sick covering a mouth of jagged fangs with flesh stuck between the teeth, and eyes that had gone from a dark green to a corpse-like pale blue. She lunged across the cellar at me, but I was able to dive back up the hatch and relock the padlock before she reached the top of the stairs. The chain was holding, but barely, as it fairly slammed against the trapdoor. Now I was faced with a conundrum that I hadn't thought of before. The Wendigo was real. I'd made it. But how the hell was I going to get it out of my house? I didn't stand a chance of fighting it off if I opened the hatch, and the chain wasn't going to hold forever, so time was a factor. I had to rely on its predatory instincts and pray it would go for an easy meal. Benoit was still in the shed, I remembered. He was putrid and beginning to bloat, but I doubted it was going to care at that point. I dragged the corpse into my living room, and it certainly sensed that there was food, as the slamming against the trap door got even more desperate. I positioned Benoit toward the kitchen nook, and then took a position behind the trap door where I unlocked the chain and took a step back as quietly as I could. It climbed out of the hatch, crawling around the room on all fours, sniffing aggressively, eventually making its way to its brother's body. From what I could tell, it didn't seem to be able to see that well. What used to be Gwen was aware of me, but seemed content with the easy meal for the time being. While the four-wheeler in the shed wasn't the ideal getaway vehicle, it worked out fine as I sped down the hill. As I drove down the trail, I was able to hear the distinct call of a Wendigo echo through the trees again. I stayed at the empty shack that housed the Bobcat rentals for two days while I waited to make sure the Wendigo had left, and when I went home, it was gone. Only a bloody mess and what was most of a teenage boy's skeleton, and a blood trail leading to the trees. I'm not crazy. Wendigos are real and I saw two in my life with my own eyes. I still hear it scream in the woods, and sometimes I even catch glimpses of it. I haven't gotten a picture yet but I'm hopeful. Every now and again I'll find its handiwork. Elk and other animals ripped to shreds. I don't expect her to move on any time soon, What with hunting season starting soon on the mountain again, it'll have prey a plenty, and I'll be able to study it up close. It also seems drawn to my house and likes to stay close by. Maybe it senses I'm food, or maybe it's drawn back from some vague memories of where it was born. Every so often I see it on the monitor when it comes close enough to set off a perimeter sensor, and every time I hear its guttural screech echo through the trees, I can't help but chuckle. Everyone knows it's Wendigo. Second story. I saw something in the woods of Nova Scotia, Canada. I need to know what it was. This is a story I haven't really told anyone. Jeez. If it weren't for my best friend being present when it happened, I probably would have gaslit myself into believing it was a nightmare, or I was just going plain nuts. It's one of those memories that, no matter how much time goes by, you never forget. The details don't get muddy for even a moment. It was 2012, my freshman year of high school. I was 15 years old and had been in the company of my best friend that night. Let's call her Marie. We lived in a fairly small town on the eastern coast of Canada, Nova Scotia to be exact. It was an old mining community sat in the middle of the woods to paint a picture for you. There wasn't really much to do. Our economy had tanked many moons before the rest of the country, so outside of hard drugs or crime, all you really had to do was walk around. Marie and I just so happened to have made walking a bit of a natural pastime. We properly mapped out that entire town and its surrounding hills and forests in rain, shine, sleet, or snow. We'd seen everything our little community had to offer from its vast range of wildlife to its colorful selection of junkies. Please, keep these tidbits in mind before you tell me what we saw was an animal or a human. It was an autumn night, with nothing more for two high school girls to do and homework not being something we specialized in we decided to go on one of our many town walks. This night in particular had us go a little off the beaten trail. You see, typically we'd have stuck to the main roads, probably ended up at a Tim Hortons before calling it a night and heading back home, but not tonight. Tonight we decided to walk by the food bank. 
You might be wondering what the draw of an old food bank is. You see, it wasn't just a food bank. Back when we were still a mining town, our food bank was a train station. Trains would come by and pick up coal that was freshly dug from the coal mines and take it all across the country. The old train yard was still there. It's now rust-covered cars acting as mock tombs to a much more prosperous era gone by. We'd frequented the train yard with our friends in the past, climbing the cars, sneaking inside among other things that could have gotten kids hurt. So it wasn't a new place to us at all, and we thought that since it was at the tree line, tucked away in a quiet enough part of town that we could freely walk and chat without the concern of traffic or the like, Sidewalks weren't very frequent on that side of town. The sun had already set as we made our way down the long stretch of road, that October chill grasping at our small frames like glue while the all-too-familiar autumn smell of still-dying plant life had permeated the air. We were talking to each other about what teenage girls typically babble about. Boys, Facebook, you know, real important stuff. We had been so caught up in our conversation of the most dire importance that by the time we had made it to the fence that lined the train yard, it genuinely took us a moment to notice the noise. It was a very clear scream. We stopped dead in our tracks and began to stare at each other, not so much out of fear but bewilderment. It didn't quite sound like an animal, but it definitely didn't sound human either. I've gotten up close and personal with enough cougars wolves and toddlers to know that this screaming we were hearing was caught somewhere in between man and beast. We stood there, glaring into each other's eyes for a few more seconds before finally turning our attention towards the sound. It was dark, mind you, not pitch black as there were some street lights around though few and far between, but we couldn't see anything. To us from where we were standing it was just an old train station turned food bank, a rusted out fence, and a couple of unused and falling apart train cars. The screams didn't subside as we were now staring into the foreground of what became a series of mental photographs of the area. It was then I realized that just up ahead, the third and final train car sat partially covered from our viewpoint by a few bushes. I had turned my head to Marie, a mischievous grin donning my face like a cowl. Last one to the train car has to buy the French Vanillas. I exclaimed before quickly jogging along the side of the fence toward the final car. I heard Marie call out, Hey, wait up, as my feet clearly were acting before my brain. I mean, gosh, this could have been some wild animal or really anything, and I was just running into blind. I'm not particularly a brave person, and I'm honestly not sure why I did this or anything else that happens from here on out. I rounded the fence, the screaming getting louder and louder as I strode closer and closer. My heart began to race with both anxiety and sheer excitement. I wasn't sure what I was even getting myself into or what I was expecting to see at all. Needless to say, about a second later, the ever-increasing beating from my chest had come to a standstill as my heart had made itself a new home in my throat. I stopped so quickly Marie had slammed right into the back of me, but I was so frozen in fear at what I was now looking at that I barely even budged, the screaming still echoing off of the forest so loudly I could barely hear the faint whisper of an, oh my god, escape Marie's lips. No more than about 20 feet away from us, crouched just under the train car, was a pale, hairless, and naked person. It was just sitting there under the front of the car, screaming into the darkness of the autumn night. Each time it screamed its arms would leer forward from under the car, they extended out to an unnatural length, almost like two tree branches. We both stood there, frozen in a mixture of fear and confusion. What were they doing? Were they hurt? On drugs? A million questions had begun to race through my head, and one look at Marie's face had told me the same questions were racking her mind as well. We must have stood there just watching in complete awe for what felt like five minutes, but realistically it couldn't have been more than a few seconds, maybe a minute at the most. That's when, in my infinite wisdom, I decided to take a few steps closer. I took my first shaky step towards it, I felt Marie's hand grasp my arm as if to say, don't. 
but it was clear that her fear outweighed her functionality as I easily broke from her grip just by continuing forward. I had closed about five or so feet of distance before stopping. I continued to stare at it from my position for another moment before clearing my throat and stammering the words, H. Hey, are you okay? The second I said those words, any thought of this being a person in need of help had flown out the window and dissipated in the cool nighttime air. Almost as if someone had hit stop on a recording, the screaming it had been happy to emit had ceased and then. It was staring at us. You need to understand, it didn't seem to even move its head. It was just one second staring forward into the night and the next right back toward us. A faint growl began to seep into the area now from where it was positioned as I took in the details of its face in which I had become sure it wasn't human. It had a mouth that seemed to take up the width of most of its face, like a thin crack in a slab of concrete. Its eyes were small but almost glowed in through the darkness with the most piercing yellow I have ever seen. After it had taken its time to mimic our staring back at us, its crack-like mouth had almost cartoonishly curled into a smiling man, like grin, its lips parting to reveal its long, jagged, and razor-like teeth. The beast and I continued locked into this war of attrition, though it was admittedly clearly more confident in being the dominant one in the exchange of looks. It broke the stare down after another moment, bringing its long, twiggy arms up from under the train car. It wrapped its fingers around the lip of the car and at a near breakneck speed kicked itself out from under the train car with a swing. Almost like a chimpanzee leaping from one tree branch to another before landing and planting itself on the ground in a pose akin to that of a frog. It continued to its gaze which now had begun to feel as though I was being sized up. My whole body had been shaking at what was akin to Mach 5. I tried to avert my eyes, look anywhere else as it felt like any moment I would pass out in sheer terror, but I was drawn in. It felt almost like it had me in some sort of trance. I watched as it slowly began to stand, unfurling itself from the position it was in. It just seemed to get taller and taller until what I was looking at was at its full stance. Its entire body, a pasty gray. Its arms had drooped down well past its knees, and its legs hooked in the back near the calf, almost like a goat. The words I'm not religious in the slightest, though I was raised Catholic in my younger years and the only words I could think to muster were Hail Mary, full of grace, as I began to pray and stared down what I was sure was my end. The creature then leered itself forward, throwing its arms back as its jaw unhinged itself from its skull and dropped down to about its collarbones as it let out one final shriek, the noise embedding itself in my brain and making sure not to ever leave, to forever haunt my nightmares along with the image. I closed my eyes so tight my head began to hurt. I could feel tears streaming down my cheeks with my lips pierced close so tightly that not even a breath could escape them and then... Nothing. Silence. Deafening silence. Was it over? That quickly? Was I dead? I slowly opened one eye, peeking out. I saw it. A final look. It had retaken its crouching position, giving us its final glance as well before it turned its back to us. An encounter that had felt like it lasted hours had then swiftly ended in that of a few mere seconds as the creature leapt from its position to the tree lean and then one final leap into the woods. Just like that, it had vanished. I had almost all but forgotten Marie was there until the softness of her voice had brought me back to Earth with a Kinsey. What the fuck was? I turned to her. Her skin had gone sheet white and her eyes were red with tears. My legs had finally given out from the sheer exhaustion of it all as I had fallen to my knees. Marie quickly running over and catching me in an embrace as we silently wept. I'm not sure too much of what happened after that. It's all a blur, really. I told some people at first, but they were quick to laugh me off as a liar or that I was simply being over-imaginative, with Marie moving away about a year later and my only witness having gone that didn't help my credibility. It's been 10 years since then. I no longer live in Nova Scotia and actually live in the same town as my best Marie again. 
We still bring this up to each other every now and again, but refrain from telling most anyone else out of fear of being labeled crazy. My last words I'd like to say are pretty blunt. If you live in Nova Scotia, Canada, please be careful. There is something living in the woods and it is not human. Third story. Something is on my property. I have lived in my home in rural Michigan for roughly four years now and have had a mostly normal experience until recently. I am an avid hunter, and as such every deer season, I'm on my property and normally go out for days to get a good buck. Well, last year I had a small incident where I broke my right arm during my final year of high school. I ended up missing the season because of it, but my dad went for our family because that's how we got fed around the winter time. After just two days, he was back and was freaking out about what he saw the night prior. He told me that one of his deer had been ripped from his truck, and his window was shattered in the process. We ended up going back with rifles to see if it was some gang of homeless people, previous experiences, and we ended up finding nothing. I thought nothing of it again until recently. I was excited to get out there, and left at midnight the day hunting season started. I like to have camp set up for at most a week's worth of supplies and normally indulge in expensive food that I make in my small wooden shack in the woods. However, this year I got some beef jerky and two pounds of tuna. It was about to go bad and ended up taking 10 pounds of frozen stew with me, which I would use the meat from the deer to make. I got to my spot at around 3 in the morning. However, I just felt. I don't know how to describe it. I guess I'd call it paranoid. I kept thinking I saw movement in the ground which was just my tarp moving in the wind. I figured I needed some sleep before going out, so I ended up sleeping until 6 a.m. or so. When I awoke, I heard the sound of rustling in my bags. I looked at the entrance to my hut to see what looked like a very small deer going through my bare bag, which I forgot to hang. I yelled and swatted it away and off it went. I remember this awful stench and seeing the thing run in an almost limping way, but there was no way this thing was hurt. It was like looking at a speeding car going 200 miles per hour. It was gone instantly. After taking in what just happened, I looked in my bag to see that it didn't get much, just chewed the bag a lot. I made some coffee and warmed some soup before putting it in my thermos and getting on my way. I got to my spot around 30 minutes after that and sat there for roughly an hour and a half, before seeing the most beautiful buck ever. I let it get closer to me and took the shot, which went right through the heart. I was more than happy with that and collected my prize. I went back to camp to put it in a few trash bags and in my oversized coolers which I had attached to the back of my little hut. After securing the deer, I decided it was lunchtime and made more soup, while still smelling the stench from last night but slightly fainter. I fell asleep in my bed while listening to a podcast and woke up at around 5 p.m. I decided to turn in for the night when I realized that my door was open. I had a space heater right next to me, so I didn't notice the cold during my nap. As I got up to close the door, I noticed a deer right outside my hut. I froze as it stared at me. It looked sick, for that was messed up, eyes that seemed slightly too small for their sockets, and horns that seemed to be very disfigured. I shouted and it slowly backed away, which terrified me. The woods were silent as this creature was before me. It did not seem scared, but curious. I slammed the door shut and clenched my rifle as I sat facing the door in my sleeping bag. I did not leave for the rest of the night until I was awoken at what I believe was 5 a.m. by the sound of metal being ripped apart. I ran out of my house with my gun drawn and headlamp on the highest setting. Big mistake. As I got to the back of my shack, I saw what I can only describe as a bear that was skinny, had horns, and was on its hind legs. I locked eyes with it and saw that this time they were far too big for the sockets. It was completely still just staring into my soul. I shot it. I'm not proud that was my first reaction, but I think that was the right choice, as it pounced at me and slammed me to the ground. In my tumble downwards, I had shot again and hit the beast. 
It let out this blood-curdling scream that sounded like you had shot a gorilla and a Karen from 7-Eleven. I ran as fast as I could out of there all the while hearing more and more screaming behind me. I did not stop until I saw the fence surrounding my backyard. I was covered in cuts. My gun was now clenched so tightly that my knuckles looked like a ghost's forehead. I looked back as the screams had ceased, only to see the deer from earlier, but only a few yards behind me. I unloaded into the animal, which dropped and let out another scream. I managed to get inside and woke my entire family to tell them the situation. The cops were called and searched the property. I showed them the deer, and it was still there, but it seemed hollow. Its insides were very small and it looked like it had deflated. It was a husk of a deer in my eyes. Skin ripped from its flesh and used as a suit by some creature. Two days later, I look up from my newspaper and see a massive buck with a hole near its heart with small, orange eyes. I have not left my house since, and every time I look out in the night, I see more. I'm scared to be in my own home. My family are all in the basement right now, and I am boarding windows. Our car tires are slashed, and the motorcycle has gone missing. A few hours before writing this post, I found the door to the garage open. As I stepped out guns drawn, the door was torn from its hinges, Fourth story, Wendigo Encounter? This is a real telling of what happened while I was on a cabin trip. A little backstory, I was 13 at the time, and I come from a family of native Dind, and we believe in many things similar to the Wendigo and Skinwalker, like La Lorana, the Whistling Woman, and alike. We also have what some call spiritual gifts that allow us to see evil spirits and negative energy, these gifts are what allow us to see these creatures and spirits, as well as being able to have a connection to God and His angels. We have been wanting to go on another camping trip for ages, and after some debate due to some of my nephews catching a bad cold, it was finally arranged. After arriving at the site, it was as normal than any other trip for the most part. Except there was mad signs of bad luck, a terrible omen, dead birds on the drive, my 7Y brother almost falling outside of our moving car due to a lock malfunction. And during the last few days of the two-week vacation, strange things started happening. Food. Drawers, cabinets, doors would be open and random chairs slash Tupperware would be missing. But we chalked it up to some rowdy teenagers at the other campsite. Though, we all knew it wasn't just some kids. This was some far more treacherous, but no one wanted to admit that it wasn't as simple as wandering animals or some thieving people. Until some days later when even stranger things started to occur. Like, hearing footsteps behind us stopping one step after we did, the feeling of being watched, and a strong rancid odor when being completely alone. Imagine feces mixed with hot rotting meat and then thrown into a fire. Although, these occurrences were a disturbance that did not deter us from staying for the final two days as we had been planning it for months. But one experience years ago on the day right before our departure still haunts me to this day. I had been strolling through the forest while looking firewood when I heard rustling in the bushes behind me. As this happened, it seemed that all life ceased around me because I could only hear my heartbeat and the lone heavy footsteps approaching me. Then I heard my name called from what seemed every direction yet echoed from in front of me while also coming from behind. The voice calling me was a harsh, raspy, animalistic and tone imitation of my sister's voice, who had just recently left the trip due to stress only a few hours ago. This had sent horrendous chills down my spine, so I ran the fastest I've ever had back towards the campsite, while I heard the twigs and leaves crunching behind me. I had finally reached the campsite when the footsteps suddenly stopped. I was relieved and slumped over to the cabin stairs when I slipped on a rock slipping out of the makeshift fire. It had caused me to head straight into it. The blazing force of nature had almost burned my face when I was just stopped mid-fall. I hadn't gained my balance. It was just as if someone was hanging on to me and pulled me back. I'm not sure what is was, but my family suggests that it was my guardian angel saving me from an early death. But after that experience, I have never been to the same campsite ever again. 
and didn't go camping for a few years after that. Still, what really scares me the most from back then was when we had been leaving the site. I looked back from the car window and saw a figure standing at the tree line staring at me. It was lanky and looked starved to the point of having its skin wrapping tightly against its bones. But when I looked onto the pathway, the footprints were completely gone. And as I blinked, we rounded the corner and it seemingly vanished into thin air. This has left me questioning what is those woods and was it a reality? But when my sister asked me why I was so shaken, I told her what I experienced and her face went pale. She had told me that before leaving, a terrifically gaunt figure had been watching us across the riverbank and that it had noticed her and ran away on all four at a fictional speed, she shakily said, staying quite frightened after. Until speaking with a phrase that still haunts me today, before I had left early, that thing had left long, deep, scratch mark on the trail sign. It was the one that it was chased me on. Fifth story. Creature in the Clearing Park Ranger Journal Entry It happened five years ago. The official ruling was that his death was caused by a rogue bear attack. You know, when a bear gets a little too used to eating human food so it doesn't feel threatened anymore and attacks a human? They all know it wasn't a bear though. Bears don't leave wounds like that. And they sure as hell don't pose the body 70 feet up a dead tree. Yeah, I said pose. But before I get into the details, I should explain a bit about myself now. I'm a park ranger in a popular national park in the northern United States. I don't want to say exactly which one, although I doubt I'll keep my job for much longer anyway. That's partly why I'm posting this. I need to tell somebody else about this story, and like I said, my colleagues don't want to talk about it. Being a park ranger has given me a lot of weird stories, and everyone is used to weird shit happening in the woods but this was on a completely different level. For days, we had been getting reports from campers and hikers about strange noises coming from a section of deep backcountry forest, growls, yipping, even human-sounding voices. Equipment and food had been going missing from backcountry campgrounds, all pretty typical stuff that can be explained away pretty easily. Many animals thieve food, make weird noises, and even the human voices can be explained by the sound that foxes and mountain lions make at night. But we needed to investigate either way because an animal that is conditioned to human food is dangerous. So we sent our veteran backcountry ranger Craig McKay. This guy had been working there for 30 years, was an expert outdoorsman, and was my mentor when I first started. As always, he jumped into the task always eager to go into the backcountry even though he was getting older. I'll pause now and let Craig tell the rest of the story. Well, his journal will have to tell the rest of the story because he isn't alive to tell it. I found his journal, a flashlight, and his backpack inside a small cave near the location of his body a couple days after he didn't return and we had sent out a search party to find him. I haven't shared this journal with anyone not even the other rangers, until now. I'm not exactly sure why I've kept it hidden other than that the truth seems so messed up and unreal, I didn't want it to damage people's memory of Craig. I'm not even sure if I believe it myself. Everything below is what he had written down over the two days he was out on his backcountry excursion. October 21st, 2011. Day one today was a long day and I can't say that I've made much progress. I've hiked about 15 miles over the course of the day, starting down in the gully where the reports first started and ending up at my current camp, which is on the southwest side of Bald Knob. I figure it's a good enough place to keep an eye out for anything coming and going through the valley. Earlier, I found some tracks in the ground in the area, and as close as I can tell they're from a mountain goat. Odd uh, that it would travel alone, but maybe it was separated from its herd or dying. It had an odd gait. I followed them for a while, but they didn't lead anywhere, so I abandoned them. Near the tracks was a pervasive smell of death, and I'm assuming a goat got separated and died. Tomorrow, I'm planning to hike across the valley to the mountain on the opposite side and see if I can't catch a track of whatever is harassing the campers. October 22nd, 
2011, morning of day two quick note while I eat breakfast. Last night was a long night. One of the longest I've had in a while. About an hour after going to bed, I heard light steps near the campsite. I grabbed the rifle and went out to investigate. No light so my eyes could stay adjusted to the dark. The second I stepped out of my tent, the noise stopped. Whatever was there knew that I was watching. I made a couple circles around the campsite and found nothing, but I could feel something watching me from the shadows. As I got back into my tent, I thought I saw a tall silhouette in the clearing. But I must have been seeing things. It was too skinny to be a bear and nothing else is that tall. The strong scent of death was still present and kept me wary all night. Today's mission has changed. I just got a radio call that a couple hikers haven't returned when they were supposed to last night and might be lost. I'm still crossing the valley today, but this time to reach where the hikers were supposed to be last. October 22nd, 2011. Night of day two stopped for the night in the valley. Cooking dinner now, chicken and rice again. Dead tired, and I'm getting too old for this. No progress on the hikers. Still smells like death though much stronger than before. Added below, I've just heard some sounds that sound like they could be voices. Can't get the radio to work in this valley. Looks like I'm not getting dinner tonight after all. Going to take a light pack and see if I can follow these voices. October 22nd, 2011. Night of day two, second entry scribbled further down the page. Dear God, what did I find? Barely made it to this cave. I can hear it scratching and gurgling outside. Going to try and block the entrance and see if I can stay here overnight. I found out where the smell of death came from. Got the cave entrance crack covered with a large rock and some brush. It will have to do. The beast is still outside clawing at the crack in the rock. Don't think I'll sleep tonight anyway. Not after what I saw. I might as well record this because these might be my last words. For the first time in my career, I'm scared. I don't even know what I saw. It was huge, about 7.5 foot tall. Impossibly fast. Smells like putrid meat. Earlier when I had left camp, the voices outside became more and more persistent. They were definitely human voices. I followed them until I reached the clearing and suddenly everything went silent. No voices. No hikers. It sounded like the forest itself was holding its breath. I heard a slight sound behind me before I was thrown off my feet. Knocked the wind out of me. My rifle was ripped from my hand before I could use it. I was picked up by my leg and thrown across the clearing. I could feel its claws dig like knives into my muscle. The thing dragged me upright against the tree and I could feel its breath on my neck breathing out a putrid smell. I could feel the blood pouring from my leg and soaking into my pants. The agonizing pain from the wound left me trembling. I could feel the weight of its body as it pushed up against me ready to go in for the kill. I heard the smack of its mouth opening and prepared myself to die when a crash in the distance distracted the beast long enough for me to make a break for it. I ran for my life. I didn't look back but knew it wasn't far behind me. About 20 feet away was the entry to this cave that I was able to squeeze into. It's still outside. I can hear it shuffling around trying to get into the crack, and I can hear the heavy breathing, the sucking, gasping sound coming from its mouth. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Dear God, please help me out of this. I want to see my wife again. I want to see my kids again. My nose is filled with the putrid smell of impending death. If I make it through the night, my plan is to wait until first light and try to escape back to the ranger station. Those are the last words we have by Craig McKay. When he never reported back, we assumed his radio had gone out of range. But after a couple days, we sent a search party to find him. Well, we found him all right. From the tracks, it looks like Craig left the cave early the next day. He makes it about 50 feet from the cave entrance when a second set of tracks catches up to him. Goat tracks. More specifically a goat with only two legs. The gait matches something that would be a bit more than seven feet, like Craig described in his journal. What we found of Craig was dragged 70 feet up a nearby tree and torn to pieces. 
He was hardly recognizable. His torso was jammed onto a short branch on the tree that kept him hanging there. His arms splayed out to his sides. His innards were strewn around the base of the tree. The jagged, shattered remains of his leg bones stuck out of the early snowfall that had come to the mountains this year. Nothing appeared eaten or missing, but not a single piece of him was left untouched by the monster. It took the rest of the day and a special rope team to get him down. The missing hikers were never found, though scraps of clothing matching what they were wearing have been found in the same valley where Craig died. Like I said earlier, the official story is a bear attack. Bears don't do this. We don't know what did this. We've rerouted trails to stay away from this area, but we still hear reports of human-sounding voices coming from the woods, and we've had more hikers than normal go missing in the last five years. Some are found, but it's always too late. Some are arranged like Craig was, broken warnings to other hikers who dare intrude upon the beast forest. Some are just never seen again. The best thing we have to go off of is this photo that we got from a cell phone found near one of the missing hikers' bags. Sixth story. Spirit of the Lonely Places. I have a story for you all. You may take this with a grain of salt. Things tend to go down better that way. My name is Franklin. I used to love camping, the outdoors, and of course hunting. I am of mostly Irish heritage, but also one-fourth Native American on my mother's side. From what I remember of my mother, she loved the outdoors, hunting, and of course camping. She used to take me on long trips into the woods. I remember little of those trips now and days. I've blocked out most of the experiences, I imagine. When I was younger, I lived in Minnesota. The legend of the Wendigo goes back a while there, and some pretty famous sightings happened near where I lived. My mother would only ever allow me to go in the woods when I was with her. Friends would often tease me about it, but after one summer, that all changed. In 1989, a boy went missing in the woods in our town. The school I went to at the time was in an uproar and filled with the whispers of every gossiping preteen there. Of course, someone had to throw it out there. It was the Wendigo my friend James had exclaimed loudly during lunch. The lunchroom went from loud to silent-ish. The hushed whispers became loud again after a while, but the note of fear was real. For four months, no trace of the boy was found. He was a well-known student, and rumors had spread that his father had murdered him. His father was a drunk, but not that kind of drunk. Most people knew not to believe the nonsense, but there was enough of a rumor to get the police's attention again. They dug up his herd, sourced his house. The proof was nowhere, but they seemed like they'd destroy what little he had to find any scrape of proof, even if it meant making it up as it were. The boy Timothy Johns had been missing for almost a year, and his father had been arrested under what we all know now as false charges. We lived in a close-lipped town, People spoke among themselves and newcomers were not welcomed often. It's funny how weird stories like these always happen in those sorts of places, right? Well, no, not really. A predator will seek out those which stray from the group. The isolated town I lived in can be described as that one sheep that is too dumb to know walking away from the flock is a bad idea. Things like this happen in small towns because it's easier to hunt prey when it's cut off easier to escape when the people of small communities know how to keep their mouths shut. It would be three years before any sliver of the real truth came into light. Me and my mother were out hunting when something happened in the town that to this day has scarred those people. A friend of mine went missing for only two hours. In that span of time, all hell broke loose. My friend Bradley was eleven and stupid. He was the class clown. The kid that took funny dares and didn't give a shit. No one disliked him. No one bullied him. He went into the woods in the early morning and didn't come home. His parents called the police and the town sent out an alert for everyone to keep an eye out. Well, they found him hours later. His body was mutilated almost beyond recognition. His eyes had been clawed from his face. The flesh of his neck was so badly damaged that his head might as well have been hanging on by only the spine and some strings of muscle. His stomach had been torn open and the muscle of his legs had been eaten away. 
An old man whose property was well within the forest had seen a lumbering monstrosity in the woods. This man was a known alcoholic, but still fairly respected in the town. He used to be the, the sheriff until the job got to him. The old man described what everyone around these parts knew as a wendigo. The police didn't take him seriously, but he had stated that he managed to get a shot off into its back. There was a large blood trail leading from the murder scene. They believed at least that he managed to harm the murderer. At the same time in the early mornings my mother had awoken me. She was bloodied and clearly in lots of pain. I was only 12 at the time of course and so I freaked the fuck out. My mother slapped me and told me to calm down and get the first aid kit. That was when the days of sleep cleared from my head enough for me to realize something. One, she was covered in more blood than she could have bled. Two, she was missing her hiking boots and had no clothes on besides the shorts and shirt she had, which seemed haphazardly thrown on. She had dirt and mud on her as well. I looked her back over and she had been shot with what looked like buckshot. The pepper spread all over made me cringe and want to throw up. She was bleeding so much that I thought she should have been dead, and yet she was still walking me through everything. I wanted to call for help, but she said we couldn't. There was no way we'd make it to the hospital in time. She was right, of course. I slowly dug the pellets out of her back with a knife and tweezers. The pellets were remarkably not too far into her skin. I knew she should have been dead, but nothing seemed to have cut through the muscle it just stopped just under the skin. I cleaned out her wounds and then sterilized them with alcohol. She yelled and for just a second I'd have sworn it sounded like an animal. She told me not to tell anyone about what had happened to her and we went home. When I got home there were all kinds of police cars and investigators all over the place. My best friend told me what happened to Bradley and I freaked out. My mother had changed into clean clothes and didn't seem like she was in pain at all. She asked around what happened and cried with the parents. After a while, the sheriff came over and talked to her, questioning her if we had seen anything strange in the forest while out there. She said no besides the lack of deer this year. There wasn't anything strange. Looking back at it now, I had known something was wrong the entire time, but I didn't want to believe it. Or maybe I had known all of the truth and just chose to ignore it completely until it just became lost in my memories as a bad dream. Investigators questioned everyone, the parents, the children, might as well have asked their pets as well. Of course, my mother had no motive from their perspective. On top of that, where we had been camping was a couple of hours away from where Bradley had been murdered, and the only road leading up to the trail we were on hadn't seen any traffic. She had a firm alibi in at least that sense. No one was ever charged with the murder and my mother acted as if nothing strange had ever happened on that camping trip. Saying that I must have had a nightmare, I couldn't argue with her. She had no scars on her back after all. It was when I was 15 that I began to experience strange dreams, not the typical hormone-filled teenage sex dreams, but dreams of a wild hunt and of hunger, a hunger that couldn't be satisfied. It was winter of that year when me and my mother went hiking that I came to my final conclusion of all of this. I had told her about my dreams and she had acted strangely about them, almost giddy like a schoolgirl. We had brought only things for hiking and some camping stuff, because why not? On our first night out she asked me if I wanted to go hunting, she knew we had no hunting gear, so I gave her a are you joking look. She laughed at the face I made at her then she put her hand on my shoulder. She didn't shrug it off like it was a joke. She meant it I could see it in the childlike innocence in her eyes. What had changed? She was typically so serious. She was unfortunately my best friend at this point. I was seen as strange by my friends because I wasn't afraid of the forest. On this, my last outing I lost all self-control and frankly I do not remember everything. Bits and pieces come back sometimes, but they're a fleeting memory. Five people died that weekend, three out-of-state campers, a locally known homeless man, and the old former sheriff. I didn't dream it. I acted on instinct as a monster, filling my hunger with my beast of a mother. We hunted these people. We hunted them because I needed it. Because we had to. 
because the animals had ran low again. Seventh story. My nightmare. It's been started since me and my partner had a breakup. I'm a very heavy dreamer and I dream almost every day with the ability to influence it, but since that issue it's happened. I had a dream of my future kids with her. I had them a lot every time, but the first kid was always being creepy. Normally, she's knock on the door asking to sleep with us, but now she was there at the door a shadow not saying a word, but watching closely like she was looking for something. She's always just asked to get it with her teddy, but nothing just a silence. I call out to her asking if she's okay, to which I get a breath smile response, not yet, what I make out of it. I then take her to bed and tuck her in she the whole time smiling and staring at me even after I leave watching her I return to my room and get into bed but that's when I notice something feels off. I look down my bed and see her at the end of it looking at me with observing eyes and a creepy smile. No words are said but I look to my wife and to my shock she's gone too I look back and I see my daughter looking at me more deformed than before I'm unable to move and do anything trapped in the bed I see her arms stretched and skinny her whole look deformed and some antler. Horns on her head protruding very wide out with her razor sharp smile and drool losing form her mouth her body growing and looking at me with happiness. I sit there terrified unable to move she moves more forward and goes to kill me but I scream and close my eyes only to find myself awake. I'm outside with my family normal until we play hide and seek in the woods it goes on for too long and I notice something is off I walk back into a tree that moves. I think nothing of it until I notice it wasn't a tree but my deformed daughter she chases me around the forest no matter what turn or move I take she's always there. I manage to find a house and hide but I look behind me and see her little normal self looking at me for hugs I run and get grabbed by the creature its face is a mix of my daughter and some monster merged it ripped my body apart and leaving me in the floor but ass. It wanna kill me, I wake up for real. Sorry if I didn't make sense it's really late at night and I've been having this nightmare five days in a row and I'm terrified please tell me what this means thank you. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel horror in detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.